Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sky Corkin, and I'm the Communication and Engagement Coordinator with SRNA. And today I've got three very special guests with me, Scott, Francis, and Andreas, who I will let introduce themselves in just a moment. But today we're gonna to be doing a community round table, which is really exciting. We first did one of these for Rare Disease Day in February, and you guys loved it. So we decided to bring it back for MOGAD Awareness Month. So just really quick, if you have any questions or anything that you kind of want to ask our three guests, that is great. We will have some time for some Q&A at the end, but we might weave in some questions as we go along. So feel free to put those questions in the chat. There is a specific section, section excuse me, for Q&A, and you can put that there as well. So, and we'll do our best to kind of answer them as we go along. So with that, I kind of just want to get us rolling because I know we're on time today. So like I said, my name is Sky Corkin. One of the first things I wanted to talk about first was just kind of asking our three speakers, how has your life changed since your diagnosis? Have you found a new normal? And if so, how? This is a big conversation that comes up with our community members a lot. And it was a big thing that we talked about at our previous round table. So I kind of want to start there. So Scott, Andreas, Francis, one of you can kind of go first and introduce yourself and then kind of get right into the question. I don't mind starting. Yeah, so, go ahead. Hey everyone. My name's Scott Tarpey. I'm from the UK, live in the north of England. And my sort of journey with Morgan antibody disease started back in 2020, just before the pandemic started. So in March 2020, I was studying for, I'm training to be a chartered accountant. And I was down to my last four exams and I'd taken the week off work to sit two exams. And I remember waking up on the Monday morning with a small bruise-like feeling on my lower, lower back. Felt like a bruise, but without the pain is sort of the best way I can describe it. And over the course of the next four days, that spot spread all the way up, up my chest. And then eventually that led me to being admitted into hospital on sort of end of day four with lack of sensation from the neck down and lack of strength from sort of like the waist down. Thankfully, I made a really good recovery. I was treated at a really sort of main teaching hospital that we have here in the UK. And originally diagnosed with, with transverse myelitis inflammation of the spinal cord but my neurologist actually predicted it was morgue antibody disease before it was confirmed by a morgue antibody disease test so yeah that was pretty impressive and so i made a pretty good recovery overall the treatment was was good and i'm almost back to i'd say normal i'd say it's 95 percent of the way there i still have some issues mainly to do with bladder bladder issues due to where the the inflammation on the spinal cord occurred. So how has my life changed since the diagnosis? It's looking back at it now, it's it's kind of a bit weird. I keep referring to that that attack as being the best and worst thing that's ever happened to me. So the worst thing in terms of the having to go through the recovery, being bed bound for a few days and then slowly working my way back up to walking and then running and then trying to get back to normal. And so it's been through a lot in terms of that way, but I, I also look at it as in terms of probably the best thing that's ever happened to me in terms of the connections that I've made. I think some of the like involvements that I've had with the nonprofit organizations and advocating for Morgan antibody disease, the people I've met has been absolutely phenomenal. And also sort of my perspective of life before the condition in terms of now, I think I had a lot going on and I was doing well, but I was almost coasting in life and taking things easy. And ever since then, I've sort of taken to, you know, you, you don't take every day for granted. We don't know what could happen in the future. So it's definitely spurred me on to do bigger and better things. And my mindset, my mentality on life has changed a lot. And I think overall, it's a, definitely a net positive. I feel much more better with the person I am now than what I was before being diagnosed with the condition and dealing with it. Yeah, no, that's really great. You mentioned that you 
you know, have gotten into some advocacy work. And can you talk just a little bit about my myelitis and, you know, kind of how that got started? And then we'll move to Andreas and Francis to answer that question. Yeah, so my myelitis, it was originally started as a website as basically an accountability blog to hold me accountable. I was sort of looking back through the attack and it's sort of, oh, could I have gone to the hospital a bit sooner? Could I have seek, you know, like seek, seek help a bit earlier? What could I have done a bit better? And in the end, I was like, this is a rare condition. Not many people know about it. My main doctor didn't know about it. And even after, after it happened, he was reviewing my notes and said he'd never heard of it. So I can kind of forgive myself for that part. But going forwards, now that I know that I'm diagnosed with this condition, if that was to happen again, that's much more on me. So I kind of used the website as sort of an accountability blog to say, this is where I am, this is what I've been diagnosed with, and this is what I need to do to kind of keep my life on track. But then as time has gone on, it sort of turned into more of an advocacy platform with creating blog posts and videos on YouTube to basically talk about more antibody disease because outside of a few nonprofit organizations, there wasn't much information out there. And basically, when I was recovering, I had to read through all the research papers, which is an absolutely horrible experience having to Google every other word, especially if you don't come from a medical background like me. So I just wanted to take that information, distill it and bring it, you know, bring it down to a level where people could understand. And then I would, I'd be doing that for my own sort of benefit. But if I can then take that information and spread it to more people, then that, that's great as well. So that's like kind of where it's turned out to today. Yeah, that's great. No, that's really wonderful work. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Andreas or Francis, do either one of you kind of want to hop in and kind of address that question and introduce yourselves? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll go. My name's Andreas Melitsinopoulos, and I was, I was diagnosed with MOG as well as CIDP last February 2022. And kind of a similar story to Scott, like a month, month or two prior, I was just working from home, looking at, at the screens. And I noticed that you know, the vision in my right eye was a little blurry and kind of gradually my feet started to feel just really cold and numb. And, you know, like a week or two prior to that, I had gone for like a few mile run like I was feeling really good I played division one soccer and in my undergrad so I always tried to like take care of myself and my body was just kind of changing slowly and I went to my local ER did, did a couple different tests but they ultimately pegged it to stress and anxiety which at the time I was working incredibly long hours and I was probably working too much but over time, as I saw ophthalmology, neurologists, we found optic neuritis in my right eye and then a number of lesions down my spine. So the first, I guess, thought or, or well, diagnosis was multiple sclerosis. And at that point, I was just happy to have an answer so I could try to tackle something. I think the unknown of it is probably one of the more scarier things. So I wasn't really like perturbed by that, but like any kind of life-changing diagnosis, you should always kind of seek other opinions. And I thankfully was able to get admitted to see some MS specialists in New York who, again, you know, you typically wouldn't look at these super rare diseases, but they were able to look at my MRIs and deduce that it was pretty atypical for MS. So yeah, I mean, in, in about a month's time, I went from like, like I said, going for a run to using a walker, I lost about 40 pounds. And I was there for two weeks. I got treated with solumedrol and IVIG. And I was able to stand up after and kind of walk on my own and over time through more spinal taps and more tests. We ultimately found MOG, which, again, it was just a big relief just to have the answer. And I think the first thing I said was, it's just a really rare thing, but ultimately just just happy to know. And yeah, I left I left the hospital walking, but about a few weeks later, I was back on my walker. I, I, I guess I just sort of relapsed from there, lost strength sensation, 
and my legs. And I was like, okay, back to the drawing board. What do I need to do from here? And it was just a lot of, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Like I lost all sensation and use in my right hand. So I was there for five days a week. I was able to take a few months off from work. And I think ultimately now when I look at where I am now, basically a year later, you know, I still have some sensory issues, numbness in my feet and kind of like that tightness and spasticity, but I've since stopped going to OT. I've got cleared from that and back to kind of playing sports again, which is a bit of a new normal because maybe I'm like the surface of things with these types of like invisible diseases. People wouldn't know that I can't really feel my feet when I'm doing things, but ultimately I guess part of finding that new normal is just knowing that you still can. There were a couple different goals that I'd always had, like going to grad school, which I'm doing currently. And part of that was just accepting that I needed my time to, you know, rebuild and focus on myself and really just focus on what's important, which would be like my health, where I was probably way too bogged down or focused on like my work. It definitely gave me a newfound perspective on what's more important in life, like the family and friends who supported me and helped carry me up the stairs when I couldn't do it myself. Being more involved in my communities and everything like that. So definitely finding that new normal is important, but it, I think it's also important to say that doing it on your own time and finding what's best for you is important. Like I, I wasn't going to live my life by anybody else's accord or put my focus into things that weren't benefiting me. So it definitely put things into a much more uh, broadened perspective than probably how I was living my life previously. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, that's huge. Thank you for sharing. And I'm glad you brought up you know, friends and family and stuff, because we'll be getting to that in a little bit, because I do have a question about support. But yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Francis, did you kind of want to hop in and answer that question for yourself and say hi? Yeah. Hi. Hi, guys. My name is Francis. I'm a Filipino. I'm a nurse here in Germany. And I was diagnosed smog last 2019. And yeah, it really changed my life. And I completely agree what Scott and Andreas shared. And really, it's a new normal, even right now. It happened last time, during that time, first headache and then um, eye pain. And I thought it was just migraine. So I was just sent to, to check for my eyes, to check if I need glasses. But they told me it's not. So my mom told me, you need to go to the to the hospital and then i was sent there and then they made a lot of blood works and then lumbar puncture and first they they suspected all oh, if it is multiple ah, if it is viral or bacterial meningitis so they started um, antibiotics and then after one week it got a little bit better but it started with my right eye that i get that it's starting to see blurredness but the worst thing is, first, I was false diagnosed first because I was sent to the, to the rehab for further check. And then during that rehab, within that one week, I tend to get worse. I tend to walk to the left and my coordination and balance was really, really not good. And I completely understand some of the patients even helped me by walking there with the Nordic walking and stuff. And then I was sent back to the hospital and they started pretty soon for five days. They suspected first if it is multiple sclerosis and then after five doses of prednisone, they, are, they started to think if I will continue or I will get plasma phoresis. So they suspected if it is ADEM or NMO. So they started me with plasma phoresis, IJ, for five days. But during the third day, I got worse because I tend to, like, stroke. I have left-sided weakness. I can't walk. I can't eat alone. 
and then yeah i'm really thankful also for my friends that who helped me and then i tend to have double vision during that time and then i tend to see darkness and a lot of blurredness so they made again a lot of blood works and then i was sent to another hospital to check if it is multiple sclerosis or not so they made brain biopsy for me and after two weeks i was sent back again to our hospital and then waited for the result and then um they told it, it is only vasculitis so the question is what is my diagnosis so they made again blood works and lumbar puncture and then finally they were able to check from the other hospital that it says that i have a high level of mog so the question is how are they going to handle me so they asked again for a second opinion and then they started me for rituximab um and then after two weeks again rituximab and then they planned after six months and then every eight months and every, once a year the the worst thing is for this rituximab because it yeah it really helped it killed this autoimmune antibodies but it made me immunocompromised so i got herpes zoster and then it started for my mid my left face until now i still have left facial paralysis a bit but i can still i can move but during that time i really can and then i'm really and then they tapered this prednisone from iv until for 7 months and then the worst thing of this mug is i got hiccups for like like a whole day I, like it closed my larynx that i can't breathe and i was sent to the stroke last time just to monitor me and then yeah and see this rituximab it re, it helped first they started every 6 months then every 8 months and then during the corona situation they started to to lengthen it and my last therapy was 2021 march so it's now it's already 2 years so far no relapse and yeah i understand that it's a new normal i really i really believe how what you are all experiencing also it's like yeah i changed my diet i tend to eat this anti-inflammatory foods like taking smoothie or this spinach and also turmeric tea and and yeah i'm doing workouts in my home and then i'm really glad that yeah i'm here in germany because they really made a lot of of research with this so right now i've transferred to hamburg because they are now doing a research also with this mug that's they told me that yeah it's really rare so we are doing a lot of research 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 so so for now it's already three result blood result of my mug titer that i'm negative and then so far last november i got again mri and they told me that there's no lesions anymore so but until now they told me we need to still control you so every year and see last month i got another appointment there and they we talked and then they will they still told me that we need to control you because this mug is really rare and yeah i So it looks like Francis froze, but that's okay. Hopefully he can rejoin us in just a moment. Hello. But yeah. Oh, can you hear us okay? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. And Go yeah. ahead. And yeah. Yeah, sometimes I'm scared about relapse and stuff, but yeah, I just going to be it really change our life of of this disease. Yeah. there is positive and negative and the very good thing is what we're going to share also with the family because during of my disease my mother came here for me for 6 months she stayed with me and to help me 
because she was really really worried during that time <laughs> yeah yeah i bet thank you so much for sharing francis so you know all three of you have been on quite the journey especially getting diagnosed um and it took a lot to get to where you are right now and i think it's great that all three of you have you know just a different perspective on what that new normal means and the changes that have kind of occurred in your own lives but yeah let's kind of let's jump ahead just a little bit Let, let's talk about that support network what does that currently look like for you three right now and you know are there improvements that you're wanting to still make in that area is it something that you feel really confident in that you have a great support network and maybe if you want to just throw in any advice, I know Andreas and Francis, you are both very newly diagnosed. So if there are audience members who are newly diagnosed on today, kind of what you would tell that person in terms of support network and finding support. So whoever wants to start first with that one. Yeah, I don't mind going first and answering yeah, this. Go. So current support network, I'd say I'm kind of two. I've got, I've got my like personal or I don't know how you describe it, not not rare disease directly associated. So I count that as sort of friends, family, and then sort of like mentors in sort of personal lives and both in my work life and some of the coaches I've had when setting up my myelitis. And then I've also got sort of the the sort of rare disease side, so that turns under the support groups, links to non-profit organisations such as like the SRNA, Samira Foundation, the MOG Project, all those have been absolutely brilliant. I'd say that the biggest one for me would be the support groups, because I think when, when you get diagnosed with a condition like this, they are really rare. The odds of you knowing someone like in your sort of normal life that but either, I'd even say that even aware of this condition is a big bonus, let alone someone else who's been diagnosed with it. So the use of support groups, it, to just get in contact with people who understand what you're going through, it might not be the exact same sort of case to yours. Because I don't think I've ever heard of two exact cases which are exactly the same, but there's at least be similarities. And even just that little bit of similarity when you're first, after first being diagnosed, it helps so much to just to know that you're not the only person in that position. So support groups and especially just listening to other people's stories. I think you learn so much more when it's, you get taught or told other people, someone else's story, because you find your own little ways of relating to it, or you might not have the exact problem that they have, but you might think, oh, I can have that same problem, but with this area, it definitely helps you to explore some potential solutions or ways that you can you can improve that might not be obvious or might not get told to you through sort of the, the healthcare system. Any improvements? I don't think I really have too many improvements per se. Yeah, I think there's... A lot of the support networks offered by sort of like the SRNA, the MOG project are, are absolutely great and I'd definitely get involved with them if you can. Well, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll pick up from there. I think the one thing that I learned really from the beginning of my journey is that it takes a village similar to Francis. Yeah, I mean, I was with my mother for about six, seven months who was helping take care of me. But there is, there is something about, I guess, that, that sense of isolation and going through something that no one else around you is. And I think like you can find a lot of solace in the types of support groups that Scott mentioned and the various events that are held. Like I recall going to like a young adults meeting through SRNA like a few months back. And just sharing our stories, I was able to connect with some of the attendees and talk about, you know, our treatment plans, what physical therapy has been like. Because um, even when you go to physical therapy or even 
even your doctor's office, like there's just a level of like ambiguity with these types of diseases, like not just for MOG, all the other diseases that SRNA supports. So just being able to talk to people going through or who have been through similar instances kind of helps with that, you know, sort of feeling of isolation in that sense. Of course, having physical support is important as well. Varying on, you know, level of disability, but it takes a, a village, I would say, in the physical sense, as well as in the emotional sense, just being able to talk to people and being able to sort of branch out out of that shell can be very difficult when it comes to these types of diseases. I guess for me, I don't know if I could say any improvements, like I'm incredibly grateful for the support that I received from family, friends, but even more so from groups like this and charities like this, where, you know, you at least have an outlet to not even that you need to say anything, but just to learn that you're not alone in it. I think there's a lot of power in that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, Francis, I, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I agree with what you guys shared. And with the support group, I'm really thankful that I've, first, I'm really thankful that I met Julia in MOG project. And then we shared and she connected with me. And then also in SRNA, one of the support member also here in Europe, we really met here. She came here in Hamburg just for us to meet and then share with each other. And also with Sumaria, Sumaira Foundation. And yeah, this support group, I'm going to say is, I know people will just say, oh, he's normal, she's normal. You don't know inside because yeah, physically we are okay, but inside it's not like that. And this support group is, is a feeling that empathizing and then saying that you are not alone, sharing how you feel and how you are experiencing, because some people can understand how we are dealing with it. They, don't, they just say, oh, he's okay like that. He, she or he looks fine like that. But you don't know because, yeah, we still have a lot of weird stuff in our body that we can't even explain also. Yeah, with our bladder problems also. And also sometimes when we are stressed, I'm going to say sometimes when I'm stressed, I'm still seeing a little bit of blurredness a bit. And then with this support group, I'm going to say it really helped me also to share that, yeah, that I'm not alone. And also, yeah, also for the people to listen to what they are feel, saying or I'm experiencing because placing yourself in their shoes because you experience that also. And at least they will be able to yeah lift them up and say that you're not alone. So whatever you are, I'm experiencing, guys, this support group, they really help at least. And also, yeah, your family. I understand. I've met also that his he his or her family can understand how she or she is feeling but at least this support group is one of the people who can understand you and then what you are yeah experiencing the stuff so yeah yeah thank you andreas if you don't mind i kind of want to go back to something that you had said at the very beginning and this was actually brought up by Julie in the Mog, from the MOG project yesterday in her conversation. She, it took her a long time to get diagnosed. And even kind of prior, they even at one point kind of referred her to a psychiatrist. And you had said when you were first kind of trying to figure this out, they had just told you it was anxiety. So there was the sense, I'm assuming, of, you know, it's kind of in your head or it's just not what it is. And unfortunately, I do think this is something that is pretty common amongst our community members. So how did you, I guess, deal with that is my question. And if there was anything that you can kind of tell somebody who might be experiencing that now from doctors 
what would you share with them? Do you have any advice to navigate that? Yeah, that that's definitely one of the harder parts, I think, or was one of the harder parts of the whole process. I think just being honest, like honesty is the best policy. I found that in my diagnosis journey that I was trying to adhere to or try to like make my family like a, like less worrisome through the process. Like my mother was with me in the ER when they said it was stress and anxiety and she was relieved, but I knew deep down that, you know, something was inherently wrong. So I think the main word is advocacy. If you can sit there and advocate for yourself, I, like I left the hospital that day knowing that something was really wrong. And it unfortunately took my disability to progress as fast as it did in that month's time to really kind of like get the you know red alert going in it. But even in the next steps, when I got my first spinal tap, I remember asking uh, the doctors that were doing it, are we testing for anything else? I had Lyme disease a few years back, like, are we testing for that? And then MOMOG, and they just said, oh, no, like, we're going to confirm it's MS, like, we believe it's MS, which is like, it's not daunting to hear because they're saying it's MS, but just kind of like that lack of exploration in it, you know, it's meant to be a diagnosis where you try to cross everything off of the list. So even then when it, it's tough, cause you don't even know that the questions to ask <laughs> to really figure it out, you know, I'm, I'm not a neurologist, but if, if your gut's telling you one thing, I would say to trust it and to just keep trying to get the answers. Even again, when I went to the next hospital going through the same sort of processes, there's always going to be a lot of doubt for medical professionals. I was on the neurology and stroke floor, and one of the nurses that I had in the first few days, they really hammered home how important it was for me to just advocate for myself. There's a lot of people on that floor that that couldn't. So kind of dealing with, I guess, the doubt of doctors or sort of you know, managing through that is just you need to have that voice for yourself because no one's going to speak for you. And I thankfully had, you know, family around me as well to help sort of like, you know, verify that. But there's a distinct difference between stress and anxiety and then the physical things that I was going through. So being honest, completely honest with what you're feeling, not leaving anything out, feel like feeling that it would be embarrassing or anything. Because you only get this one life, and it, the more you try to search for those answers, you know, at least you're giving yourself a chance. The, the doctors advised to me that if I had stuck with the MS diagnosis and got treated, I would have ended up in a wheelchair. So that really hammered home the fact that if we didn't seek further opinions or, you know, if I just went against my gut feeling that something was wrong and we didn't try to go through every avenue that we could, then my life would be very different now. So, Yeah, thank you for expanding on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I said, I think, unfortunately, that's something that a lot of our community members face. So I appreciate you sharing more. I do want to open up the floor to the audience who's watching. If you have any questions now, let's go ahead and ask. I do have one more question that I want to ask the group. But if you have questions, please put them in the chat and in the Q&A, and we'll kind of pull from there. So don't be shy. But I did want to ask a question sort of related to identity. This is something that has come up a lot within our support groups over the last few months. I guess I want to know, how do you view your diagnosis in terms of your and how it fits with your personal identity. Is it a big part of it? Is it a small part? And Scott, I'd actually love to kind of start with you if that's okay, but do you kind of want to expand on, I guess, how you view your own personal identity with this, if you're comfortable sharing? Yeah, so it's funny, this actually came up in my sort of workplace not too long ago. So I work for the NHS in, in the UK as an accountant, and we're currently going through, in my part of the organization, a big restructure. And one of the questions which got posted on one of the sort of big like announcements or 
webcast that they did was, you know, how is this restructure where they're planning on reducing the headcount of the organization from 30 to 40% down? Like, how is this going to impact on people who have disabilities, you know, all different sorts of like ethnic backgrounds and, and, and all that? And it kind of got me thinking that it's like, well, how, where does my sort of position fit into this? It's like, because here in the UK, we have a, the law, which is the Equality Act 2006, I believe, that has a list of protected characteristics. And one of those is disability. Now, for the legal case of being disabled in the UK, there is a very fixed definition of what you have to meet in order to be classed as disabled. And I was looking at this, this like the criteria. And I was like, I don't think I quite meet this criteria, but just because I'm not disabled by that amount, it's like, what, what actually am I? Because I know I'm not 100% sort of healthy or what I was before this happened. So yeah, it's a bit of a confusing one. I I don't really like the word dis- sort of disabled anyway, and the, the, you've got the the other one as differently able, which I think I I just like even less so, in terms of what does differently able mean. That I'm an accountant, I can do accounts, but you can't. Does that mean we're differently? It's so yeah. I, I'm not. I don't think I'm a big fan of much of the language in terms of in terms of it, but ultimately on social media, it's you know how people choose to present themselves with, with those sort of things. So for me personally, yeah, it's been difficult because I'm not too sure where I quite fall. I just know that I'm a person who has this condition and that's kind of how I relate my identity around. And then all the other things on top of it, such as my job, that my interests and that also involved in that. But I, I haven't quite found sort of one word sort of where I fall under in terms of what describes me from that identity. I guess advocate is probably like the best way because I'm not just a patient, ultimately. I want to both help myself and help other people and collaborate with other people in this space so that we can have better effects for more people, more positives. So, yeah, I guess advocate is probably the best way. I'm not too sure about anything else. It's definitely a tricky one as to where you people think they fall on that sort of... Mm-hmm. No, yeah, I identity. appreciate it. Yeah, and I appreciate you know, you just saying that you're still trying to figure it out, because I do think it is something that a lot of people feel. They're also still trying to figure it out. So I do appreciate you saying that. Um, Andreas or Francis, do you want to answer that? And then I did see we had a question come in from the audience as well. So go ahead. Auntie, I I experience also what Scott told with this handicap or with this disability, I tried also to apply 2019 here in Germany, but I was denied because still, after I was, I got sick, I got sick, yeah, I got sick for more than seven months during this month. And then I came back. I was working before in intensive, as intensive nurse here in Germany. And then I was transferred to endoscopy because the company doctor told me it's really stressful for you and you are taking this rituximab and you are really exposure for infection like that. And then, but I was denied disability and the really, yeah, really funny thing is I transferred here in Hamburg and now I am working in opt, as opt, opta nurse here. And it's really, really funny because it's just saying I got optical neuritis and <laughs> I'm here in <laughs> off the ward also. And then I asked also some of the doctors here with this optical neuritis and they told me most that is one of the symptoms of MS. And then um, that's for me, yeah, identity for me, even though I would say positive, even though I am positive from MOG. <laughs> but I'm still being positive of what happened to me right now. Yeah, I'm a bit sometimes scared of this relapse, but I can say, yeah, there's no, until now they can say if you are monophasic or multiphasic, this mug. But I'm just going to say being positive and uh, just keep going. I know it's really hard, it's easy to say this, 
but just keep going because yeah i know it's still under study this mug but yeah just continue and don't give up thank you andreas are you comfortable sharing yeah i'll i'll try to be quick cognizant of time but i i would say for like you know your own personal identity it it's pre it's pretty difficult at the same time because it kind of like silos you or puts you into buckets. Like when you're applying for jobs, disclosing if you have a disability or not, whether you feel like you need to say that for certain accommodations for things, it puts you in a difficult spot regardless of you know, where you are physically. I, I agree with Scott in the sense that, you know, emotionally just being an advocate and not letting the disease define you is ultimately what matters because you can still be yourself and you don't need to put yourself into a word, you know, to be yourself, a word like disabled or anything else. I think that's my main takeaway from that. I'm not necessarily letting the disease define me, but I am living my life according to trying to help as many people as I can with these types of diseases. And I think that's that's a that's one way to find your own identity as opposed to just pigeonholing yourself into a bucket that you don't want to be in or that you don't feel like you need to be you essentially make your own in a way no i think that's really well said thank you we did have i know we're coming down just to the last few minutes but we did have a question from an audience member and i think scott or francis if one of you are comfortable taking this one, just because of what you mentioned. They said, I've found it difficult to travel or go out with friends and family with GI issues and cutting out inflammatory foods. How do I deal with that? Do, does any, do either one of you kind of want to take that one or at least kind of talk about what you do? Okay. I'm going to say, yeah, with the bladder thing, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm still having trouble sometimes, even like one within an hour, I tend to go to the bathroom like two times or three times. It's really weird. And then I understand this anti-inflammatory foods because it's really, I'm not saying that I'm really religiously eating this stuff, <laughs> but I'm, <laughs> I'm eating every other day and stuff. With this GI, it will take time because I know even during that time, not only this bladder problem before I got also bowel movement problems. And then it will take, yeah, I'm not going to say how many years or months, but I know it's really hard because for me, I struggled, struggled that also it's really not easy. And then some people are just going to be, yeah, just going to question, why are you going there like that, immediately like that? How can I say this? Mm, try to just take step by step with this, some, for example, for this anti-inflammatory. Yeah, I'm taking turmeric tea every night. And just to help me, just and also this probiotics, like um, yeah. Also here in Germany, they have this sauerkraut, and also I've learned also this Asian this kimchi, also anti-inflammatory stuff. And yeah, I'm taking also vitamins. Yeah, not anymore this prednisone because it also has been 2019. Also taking this D3 and stuff and also omega-3 and then i can't really say how to manage this stuff this gi stuff but i know it will take time because it's it's not easy like that scott yeah i can, I can quickly jump in with with this so in terms of like diet when I first was first recovering, I tried following the, the Walls diet, Dr. Dr. Terry Walls created. That 
might possibly be the most difficult diet I think I've ever tried. And it's, I, I admit, I, I think it did make a difference in recovery, but I was definitely not perfect to following it. And especially in terms of a diet, if you're trying to go out, go and eat out somewhere, the odds of you being able to find somewhere that will perfectly match that diet is it's highly unlikely. So again, just do as much as you can. You know, you don't have to be 100%. A meal doesn't have to be 100% involved with that diet. So it's just a matter of doing doing what you can with that because I don't think it'll ever be perfect. In terms of like managing bladder issues when out, the, the biggest sort of change for me was self-catheterization. So I still do it occasionally now if I know I'm going to be out of the house for like a long time. It's definitely not the, the most pleasant thing, especially with doing it for the first time. But once you get used to it, you'll realize how quick and easy it is. And when you, you compare that to the amount of freedom it does give you, it's absolutely huge for me. And it's it's helped me both traveling in this country and then also when I've gone abroad on a holiday or vacation. So I can highly recommend that. Great. All right. Well, we are at the end of our community roundtable time. I just really wanted to say just a huge thank you to Scott, Francis, and Andreas for sharing their time and their stories with us today. As they all said, sharing in, in this way is super, super impactful. It's incredibly important. So I hope you as an audience really enjoyed their conversation today. I know I did. If you have any more questions, we actually are going to take a break, but then we will have our Ask the Experts live Q&A session at one o'clock Eastern. So if you do have questions really related and maybe more on the medical and scientific side, join in there and we'll try to get to as many as we can. But yeah, just thank you again so much, guys. We really, really appreciate it. And I hope you enjoyed your conversation today together. All right. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you at the next session. Bye-bye.